purpose, we're going to talk about truth uh, as our subject for today. We'll be in John chapter 18 for our text verse, and then we'll refer back to chapter 19 several times as we go through. And we're going to talk about this thought today in this passage of Scripture. Confrontation with truth. Confrontation with truth. In John 18, in verse number 37, there's been a, a kangaroo court of the Jews. Jesus has been arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's been taken to the house of the former priest, Annas, and gone through a kangaroo court there. Annas wasn't the official high priest. He had been in the past, but his son-in-law, Caiaphas, was now high priest officially. But Annas still wielding a lot of power. Uh, he questions Jesus in front of this kangaroo court, and then they send him over to be officially tried again in the court of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. And then they send him from those, because Jews didn't have authority under uh, Roman domination. Uh, they were under Roman law, so the Jews didn't have uh, the death penalty at their disposal. They could... Uh, they could try things concerning their religion, but they couldn't put people to death. And so they send him, Jesus, over to Pilate, the Roman governor, to be tried in the secular court and to be executed, the Pharisees hope. And so that's where we find this verse number 37 of chapter 18 in John. And we'll just read that one verse to get a starting place for our thoughts about truth today. Pilate has wavered back and forth. He's a politician. <laughs> I say he's a politician. He's wavering back and forth. He, on the one hand, he probably doesn't like Jesus, but he doesn't see anything really wrong with him that he should be presiding over his trial. The Jews want Jesus executed, and so they're putting pressure on Pilate. And so Pilate's kind of caught in the middle now, he's an unsaved man. He's a wicked man. But he's, he'd just rather not be there this day. But he is. And so he has to make the decision. And here in verse number 37, it reads, Pilate therefore said unto him, unto Jesus, Art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest I am king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the, what's the word? Truth. truth. Everyone that is of, truth, of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Now eventually Pilate does have to condemn Jesus to death because of the pressure that's been put on him. But it's interesting to note the question that Pilate asked while he's in this dilemma. What is truth? And boy, don't you wish America had an answer to that question today. Yep. <laughs> America, our culture is saying, this is true, that's true. I've got my own truth and you've got your truth. And we can just all have our own truth. <laughs> well, up can't be down and down can't be up. Yep. In can't be out and out can't be in. You can't go in two directions at once. And so that's what our culture and our world actually seems to be doing today is ignoring what is truth and going by their emotions and their own feelings and their own desires. Let's pray together and we'll get into the message. Father, we love you today and thank you for this passage of scripture. What a, what a day of mixed emotions it must have been at the crucifixion of Jesus. And Lord, even as we think about it today, we have mixed emotions. I mean, Lord, we couldn't have salvation without the death of the Lord Jesus on the cross. He came for that purpose, to die for our sins. And Lord, yet we feel 
pity, grief, sadness, and even anger because Jesus was tried unlawfully, unjustly, and unmercifully. And so while we see, Lord, two different feelings, two different emotions working towards the center in us, Lord, we pray that you help us to acknowledge the truth today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the 1960s, they tell me, of course, that was long before my time. <laughs> in the 60s, the drugs of choice for the drug users was hallucinogens, LSD, mescaline, mushrooms, certain mushrooms, and, and different types of drugs would cause hallucinations. And those who were high on those drugs were said to be tripping. They were on a trip. Boy, it was it a trip. And they couldn't distinguish reality from truth. They couldn't distinguish what was real and what was imaginary. And someone who was tripping would look at a tree and the limbs would turn into snakes, waving and wiggling, and even had the skin of snakes. They would look at colors while they were tripping and they could taste the colors. And the colors were very vivid and almost blinding. And music took on a, a hypnotic trance-like state, like the Pied Piper, and music could lead people to do things that they wouldn't normally do if they had not been tripping. And some would even jump from tall buildings thinking they honestly thought they could fly because they couldn't distinguish truth from reality or truth from uh, hypnosis and trance. It was all imaginary and they couldn't tell the difference. And the weird world we find ourselves in today, even if it's not on drugs, which many are, but even those who are not on drugs seem to be in some sort of a hypnotic trance where truth and reality escape them. Would you agree with that? that there's, a, there's a lot going on in our society and among people today. And while we love people, we can't agree with the craziness that many of them embrace because it's just not true. It's not reality. I mean, <laughs> they, and I say they, I'm meaning a proportion of our society, and it's growing more and more people today think truth is not absolute. In other words, what was true yesterday is not true today. And what is true for you may not be true for me. And and if you feel something very strongly, that's truth for you, regardless of what the facts may say. I mean, when you ask a Supreme Court justice nominee, what is a woman, and they can't define it, I really wonder if I want that person judging me. <laughs> I mean, for eons, we have always known the difference between a male and a female. Biologically and from Scripture, God created them. Male and female created He them. Yep. Right from the beginning. And we've always, even the lost world, even the, the moral depravity crowd still understood the difference between a man and a woman. So I'm just giving that as an example of the denial of facts biology, science, reality, and scriptural truth, which is, by the way, the absolute truth that cannot be changed no matter how we imagine our feelings, our desires, and what we would like to see come to pass. The Word of God is the same. It'll never change. Never change. It was true 2,000 years ago, and it's true today. Never changes. Society may change. Our desires may change. Our likes and dislikes may change. And people can change, but God never changes. He's eternal. And so we'll concentrate just for a little while this morning on the greatest truth known to mankind. And this is the Christ of the cross. Do you know what everything else that people believe 
and hold as truth, none of it matters. I mean, you might like tacos and you like, might like burritos. You might like Chinese and you might like Italian. You might like uh, golf and you might like fishing. We've got all different kinds of likes and dislikes and preferences. But the one truth that overrides them all is the Christ of the cross. I mean, it doesn't matter what you like or dislike. You must know the Christ of the cross and the truth of his death and why he died on the cross. There's five types of reactions we'll see concerning this day. We're going, we're going to examine that day of the crucifixion. And there's five, at least five, different types of reactions to the truth. Pilate said, what is truth? Jesus said, I came for this purpose. He's about to go to the cross. The Jews think they're in charge. Pilate thinks he's in charge. Jesus said, I came to do this. I came to die on that cross. You're not nailing it to me. They're not nailing, nailing me to the cross. I'm letting myself be nailed to the cross. He could have called 10,000 angels to free him that day. But he said, this is why I came. This is not a tragedy or failure of God's plan. It is his plan. Jesus came to die on the cross. This was no mistake. And there's five different reactions I'd like to examine. First, the derelict. Secondly, the depraved. Thirdly, the deceived. Fourthly, the determined. And fifthly, the dedicated. We'll see all of them around this event, this fateful day. Observe with me, first of all, the derelict. Who are we talking about? Or what are we talking about? Well, the word derelict means one who has abandoned his duty or responsibility. The derelict. So who are we talking about? Well, we're talking about first and foremost, Pilate. He abandons his duty. He says, what is truth? If you don't know truth, I don't want you to judge me. But Pilate didn't know truth. If he had, to our detriment, if he had decided to free Jesus because the trumped up charges were petty and false. Jesus was not guilty of one single sin. Not breaking of one single law. So Pilate had it within his power. He could have freed Jesus, but being derelict, he refused to fulfill his duty. He refused his responsibility. He was trying to straddle the fence. The Jews are saying, crucify him. He said, well, I, I don't find anything wrong with him. And they say, crucify him anyway. And Pilate's trying to satisfy them, and he's trying to do what in his mind is the right thing and let Jesus go. So he's trying to straddle the fence. When politicians and activist judges and practically every area of careers, politics, education, when they don't know what truth is, boy, we're in a big amount of trouble. Jesus said in verse 38, I find no fault in him at all. And yet in chapter 19, verse 1, it says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. A person who tries to straddle the fence is like the apple tree that's on the fence line between you and your neighbor. The apples get ripe, and if the neighbor sees them getting ripe first, he goes out and, and takes a long pole and knocks all the apples over to his side. And so then he gets the apples, but the neighbor's mad at him. And the same thing happens when we try to straddle the fence in any area. It's, you're going to be like the Confederate soldier who wore a, a blue top and gray pants. He got shot from both directions. <laughs> Straddling the fence is never a good thing. Sometimes it results in hard feelings. Sometimes it results in animosity. Sometimes it results in your own family being maybe offended at you. But straddling the fence is never a good strategy. Pilate was trying to straddle the fence. This presents a picture of the professing Christian 
who hangs on both sides of the fence. Jesus said, I, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Now, there'll be peace eventually. When he comes back again, he'll bring peace. He'll bring a, a kingdom, and he will be in charge. And he'll rule with a rod of iron, and things will be set straight. But at his first coming, he said, I didn't come to make sure everybody was just peaceful. You know, that's, that's, the, <clears throat> that's the way a lot of things operate today is let's just have peace. I hate conflict. I really do. I'd rather be hit with a dead skunk than to be in conflict. But <laughs> as pastor, there's sometimes I have to be in conflict. I don't like it, but it happens. If you're gonna if you're gonna have a pastor who is just gonna pacify every situation, then there'll be wolves that'll creep into the flock and will devour the flock. So there has to be a willingness to confront. Pilate was trying not to confront. He wanted to bring it peacefully. And a Christian who tries to make everything peaceful, even parents. Parents, can I just tell you that raising godly children, it you can't be their friend 24 hours a day. You can't do it. You've got, you've got to be the bad guy sometimes. As Brother Brown, my evangelist friend who is in heaven now, as he always said, look, when you compare the parents and the children, always remember the parents are the big people. <laughs> some, people hadn't, some parents hadn't learned that yet. And, and they think they have to be friends with their children in every situation and let the children have their own way. Well, besides being malnourished and and uneducated because you didn't make them go to school and having yellow teeth because you didn't have them brush their teeth. <laughs> uh, they may not know the difference between heaven and hell either. And they may not know the difference between obedience and disobedience. And I was impressed, Brother Matt and Lauren, with your kids. Their, their kids are a delight to be around. I mean, they just, they're just very pleasant. I mean, they have the same probably the same pains and disappointments that everybody else does, but their kids are very pleasurable. And I enjoy seeing kids that listen to their parents. The parents don't even have to yell at them. <laughs> Yelling never pays off too good anyway. Um, but we have to be willing to fulfill our duty. Pilate didn't fulfill his duty. And so therefore, he was derelict in his duties. When a girl settles for a live-in situation instead of marriage, it's kind of straddling the fence because maybe he doesn't believe in marriage and she does, and vice versa. And so they straddle the fence and try to have the best of both worlds. And you can't do it. So we see in Pilate the derelict who wouldn't take care of his duty and according to the clear truth that Jesus was the truth and is the truth. Well, notice the second one represented here, and that's the depraved. In John 19, verse 2, we have the derelict, those who just refuse to fulfill their duty. And then you have the depraved. John 19, 2, And the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Here's Jesus. He's, he's being led through all these dumb courts. And while he's awaiting the final decision, the final execution, the soldiers plat together a crown to mock him and and to make him look foolish. And they make a crown of thorns and smash it down upon his head. The thorns crushing into his skin on his skull and blood dripping down his face. And then they put a, a robe of royalty on him and say, Hail, King of the Jews, mocking our Savior. The one who never sinned, the one who loved them, even though they were treating him that way, he still loved them. And would have saved them. They're not derelict. Those soldiers are not derelict in their duty. They were doing their duty. But they were so carnal. And they were so dedicated to materialistic fulfillment now type of methodology. 
They didn't, uh, they didn't care about the pain they were causing Jesus. They gambled for his clothes at the base of the cross. They made fun of him. They mocked him. They had no sense of morality or conscience. We know they weren't saved, but they didn't even have conscience. I mean, who could do somebody that way? Even if Jesus had, hadn't been the Savior, how could they do that to somebody? When conscience, well, the Bible says conscience can be seared as though it were seared with a hot iron. When people grow up in a culture or in an environment where there's no morality, no, no absolute right and wrong, then they become seared. Their hearts are calloused. And these soldiers were very cruel in the way they treated Jesus. They were depraved. They got some cruel kicks out of mocking the Lord and knocking him around. They cared not about the pain they caused or the grief that another suffered at their hands. You know, sometimes, can I just take a side note here? Sometimes even friends and family members can cause grief to each other, trying to fulfill their own gratifications, making themselves feel good, lifting themselves up and putting others down. And by doing that, we cause grief and pain to others. And if we don't have a sense, a good strong sense of conscience and morality and right and wrong, and for the Christian biblical standards of action, then we can cause a lot of pain for others. That's what these depraved men did. <laughs> John 19, 23 says, Then the soldiers, those depraved ones, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. <laughs> they said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but let us cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture, which they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. They were busy drinking and gambling and grabbing and Here's Jesus hanging on the cross. He's bleeding. He's got, he's got nails in his hands. He's got nails in his feet. But did they care? They're sitting there under the cross with blood dripping all around them. Blood that could have saved their souls, but they're more interested in a piece of cloth. Maybe joking and talking about things that they're going to do when this is all over and their duty is fulfilled. <laughs> Can I also tell you that we ought to remember often what Jesus did to forgive our sins. Yep. We just say, we sang the song, and I believe it just as I am. Jesus will take you just as you are, but he doesn't mean to leave you like he found you. Yep. He means to change you into his image, the Bible says. And yet so many say, just as I, I came just as I am, and I'm going to leave just as I am. Not biblical. Those soldiers sitting under the cross, those soldiers were, were within five feet of that blood that could have saved them. But yet their mind was a thousand miles away. They might as well. They were within five feet, but they may as well have been five million miles away. But yet, there's people who hear the gospel, how to be saved. And it's through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, what he did to pay for our sins. There's people that come in contact with that teaching all the time and maybe they're sitting, looking right at the person telling them, you could be saved if you'd trust what Jesus did for you on the cross. And yet walk away and think no more about it. Well, I want to bring you to the third one, the deceived. The deceived, there's some people that uh, maybe not derelict in their duties, Maybe, maybe they're not like those soldiers who were just depraved, but they're just deceived. I think there's some good people that are deceived. I think the Christian cults are full of them. They don't know who Jesus is. They like to 
talk about Jesus and sing about Jesus, but they don't know that his main purpose for coming was to die on the cross to save them from, from their sins so they can enjoy heaven and eternity with them. And they're just deceived. And they believe, many believe. In fact, most believe today that if they live a good enough life that God will just let them into heaven anyway. All the while rejecting what Jesus did for them on the cross. Some people are just deceived. And when you're deceived, you can't hear the truth. We're talking about truth today, right? Confrontation with truth. When people come smack dab into the face of truth, it's a reckoning time. Yep. We have to make a decision. I think about, about being deceived. I think about the drunk, Brother Connor, that <laughs> he got, it was the middle of winter time, the drunk was driving, he shouldn't have been driving while he's drunk, but, uh, well, he shouldn't have been drunk, I guess, in the long run. <laughs> but he was drunk and he's driving and, and there's snow drifts are getting pretty deep and he runs off on the edge of the road and gets stuck in a snow drift and the old drunk's sitting there in his car and he's spinning the tires trying to get out. And the car won't come out and so he keeps spinning the tires. It still won't come out. So finally the old drunk just leans back and decides to accept his faith and he, he goes to sleep. Well, in his drunken stupor, a state trooper pulls up and finds, finds him parked in the snowbank there on the side of the, the, the road. And so... The trooper walks up beside the car and pecks on the drunk's window. And the drunk, drunk wakes up and looks at him. He sees his trooper, his uniform. And so he shifts it into the drive and tries to drive off. And so the trooper, having a bit of a sense of humor, <laughs> the trooper's right there beside the old drunk. And the tr drunk's got that thing in drive and he's got it about 5,000 RPMs. And the trooper's beside He just start running along beside of him, running in place. And the drunk's looking up, and there's that trooper still going with it. His speedometer's registering 60 miles an hour, and there's that trooper running right beside of him. And so the trooper said, roll down your window. You can't escape. I can run faster than you can drive. <laughs> well, he was deceived, wasn't he? But there's many people who are deceived about Jesus. And they think they'll be saved because they've got a good religion. They'll never escape. The only way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 19, 6 says, When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out. We're talking about the deceived ones now. And they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him <coughs> and crucify him. For I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. Here's the very Jesus. Here's the very Messiah that those Pharisees said they were looking for. They've been taught all their life that a Messiah is coming. And the Pharisees are the, the religious elite. I mean, they've studied, man, they've studied the books. They didn't know much about the book, though. And so they'd studied, they'd gone through their education and the rituals. They had a PhD. They knew what they said they believed. But did they believe it in their heart? It's been said that the difference between heaven and hell is 18 inches from the head to the heart. They had a lot of head knowledge. They had rules. They had regulations. And boy, you had to do everything just right according to their law. And they were expecting, according to the scriptures, they were expecting the Messiah to come. Here he comes and they ignore him. I guess a lot of debates have been said, did they really recognize him and still ignore him? Or did they just not know? Were they so absorbed in themselves and that being the authoritarians over their Jewish religion that they, they just couldn't stand the thought of somebody else taking their authority away from them. People are power hungry. I see it happening in politics today. There are people, you say, you ought not to talk about politics from a pulpit. I'll tell you why our country's in such a stinking mess today is because preachers don't talk about politics. I won't tell you who to vote for, but if you vote against the Bible, you're sinning against God. If our religion, 
our Christianity, not just religion, if our Christianity doesn't dictate how we involve ourselves in education and in politics and in our job as well as in church, our Christianity is nothing more than religion. It ought to affect the way we think, the way we act, and what we do, and who we vote for. Now, you choose who you're going to vote for, but if you vote for one that's in, char- in uh, favor of killing babies, I really wonder about your Christianity. These Pharisees had drunk the power of authority and they could no longer understand that this Messiah had come. He was among them. They, de- they were deceived. They couldn't see him because that would have meant the end of their power. You say, why, why do some of the political entities do what they do? Because of power. They love having the power. They want to tell you what to do. They want to tell you how to live and how to eat and how to drink and how to think. That's what they want. And they, they don't have much concern for truth. I said that. They don't have much concern for truth. They have concern for keeping power. And it kind of trickles down into our whole society that way. We kind of like, we get a taste of power. And we can't give it up easily. People are bent on designing their own religion today. <laughs> Instead of going by the truth, they design what sounds good to them. There are religions, religions that are, they say they believe the Bible, but when you ask them, well, for instance, when they say you're supposed to go to the priest to confess your sins, My Bible says there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. It's not somebody wearing, it's not some man wearing a dress. Notice number four, the determined. This is another group of people that we see represented on this day, the crucifixion day, the determined. This was a group of one. This is Jesus, the determined. How did Jesus, the omniscient one, the all-knowing one, how did he deal with the truth? He knew that mankind was doomed without a redeemer. Man was hopeless and helpless without somebody who could pay for their sin. In the book of Romans, it tells us clearly that man is lost in sin. You can't design your own religion to get you out. Man needs a redeemer and Jesus was determined to be the redeemer. He knew that mankind was was doomed without him to redeem them. He knew that he was the one who could rescue the human race. And he's the only one, the only one who was sinless and therefore could pay for sin. And he was determined to do just that. He was determined to act on sin. Truth. You know what most of us would have done when it came to being crucified? We might have said, let that bunch of reprobates fend for themselves. I'm, I'm getting out of here. But not Jesus. Jesus said, they're helpless. They need me. They hate me, but they need me. And he said, I'm going to die for them. Even though they are crucifying me, I still want to save them. Oh, what a heart of love. Can we even imagine such a thing? Jesus loved you and me. And as it says in that song we sang earlier, to my shame I hear my mocking voice among the scoffers. Because my sin helped nail him to the cross. In John 19, 9 it says, And they went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? 
Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. He was talking about Caiaphas. He said, Pilate, you're a sinner, you're a reprobate, and you're doing wrong. But old Caiaphas over there, he, he, I mean, Pilate, you're just an old Roman. You're just an old Roman sinner. You, you, you don't know any better. You're a sinner, but you don't know any better. But Caiaphas says he's the religious authority in the whole land, and he delivered me to you. So his sin is even greater. The religionists ought to know better. James says, be not many masters among you because they'll suffer the greater condemnation. There's a lot of responsibility to take the sacred word of God from the, and stand behind a sacred desk and proclaim the word of God because eternity hangs in the balances. Jesus came to do a job and he was determined. We're talking about determination. He came to do a job and he was determined to finish it. The greatest truth a person can ever embrace. Listen to me. The greatest truth that any person can ever embrace is that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. And when we recognize that, the vilest and most awful and terrible sinner in the world can have forgiveness and be saved. There are people who have done awful things, terrible things that they would not want to be mentioned and yet God loves them and will save them. And that's the greatest truth. It doesn't matter how rich you are, how much power you obtain in the corporate world, how high you go on the political ladder. None of that matters when death comes. One thing matters is that you have a Redeemer, you have a Savior, you have a God who loves you and saved you because of the death of Christ on the cross. And that's the greatest truth anybody can know. There's a lot of truths in the world. But none greater than that Jesus died for me. Well, I need to hurry and get to the last one, the dedicated. The dedicated. The vast majority of people on the day of the crucifixion were resistant to the truth. And many betrayed the Lord Jesus that day. They betrayed the one who was pure truth and pure love. But thank God, a handful of people that day did demonstrate some dedication to him. When most fled, in John 19, 25, it says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. Ha! <laughs> You'd expect the mother to be there, wouldn't you? Mothers are special that way. Mothers will stand by their son. Mothers will stand by their daughter. Even when they're in the wrong, though Jesus never did any wrong. But do you realize what it could have meant for her, the mother of the one being crucified? She could have been put to death too. Those who were dedicated... Then it goes on in, in chapter 19 of John 25. It says, Mary's, and Mary's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, whom he loved would refer to the apostle John, no doubt. He saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then he saith to the disciple, Behold thy mother. Jesus is on the cross dying and he looks at his mother and says, look over there at John. I'm going to be gone, but he's going to to treat you like a mother. John, take care of my mother. I'm leaving, but now she's your responsibility. There were a few dedicated people still left, a handful. The mother, the other Marys, John, They're all standing about the cross. And it says about John, and from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. He treated Mary, the mother of Jesus, 
like his own mother. Well, there were a couple other guys that's notable on that day too. After Jesus was found to be finally dead on the cross, there were a couple of guys show up that had been reluctant disciples in the past. But boy, oh boy, the truth had broken through on them. I mean, the light came on. Have you ever been in that situation when, boy, I was that way when I was lost. I mean, I didn't know what to do. I, I knew what I should do, but I didn't want to do it. And suddenly Jesus was presented to me and boy, the light came on and things changed. <laughs> well, here's uh, Joseph of Arimathea. He goes and asks for the body of Jesus. And so Jesus and Nicodemus, who had been ashamed to be called a disciple, take care of the burying. And even after the grave, uh, the body had been entombed in the grave, some of the women came and ministered to the body of Jesus. There were a few dedicated people. I think this is where I was headed with this whole sermon the dedicated people. I mean, there's, there's those who dece- are deceived, but if they're s- s- deceived so badly, maybe the, the words of the gospel didn't reach them today because they're just blind. And maybe there's some that are just immersed in their own selfishness and conceit and love of pleasure that they won't see the Lord Jesus today. I hope they do, and there's always some that will. And though our gospel be rejected by the masses, there's always a few that'll still be saved. I can't save them all, but thank God there's a few that'll hear the gospel and say yes to Jesus. I'm glad to know that. So what's a person to do with this thing called truth? First, determine to find out what truth actually is instead of taking some trendy fad. What is truth? If it contradicts this, it's not truth. Ever. (laughs) There's not one flaw in the Word of God. He promised to preserve it, and we have it. If we hadn't got it here, we might as well close it up, go home, go fishing, go golfing, and never go to church again. But I believe this is the very Word of God, the preserved Word of God, the infallible Word of God, the Verbally inspired word of God. It's true. The same yesterday, today, and forever. First, determine what is truth. Now, everything that's truth is not mentioned here. God gave us everything that he wanted us to know from his word right here. But if you find something that contradicts this, it's not true. So find out what truth is. Before we can respond to truth, we need to know what is truth. And people are not asking questions much anymore. People have their minds made up. I I know what truth is because this is what I believe. It must be right. Just because I believe it doesn't make it right. It it is only right if it's truth. (laughs) Then number two, set your mind to act on that truth. When you find the truth, act on it. Do something. And number three, set priorities concerning the truth because there, there are lesser truths. They're true but there's some that are greater, like the crucifixion and the Christ of the cross. That is the greatest truth. It's more important than any other truth you'll ever know. Two plus two is a, uh, equals four is a truth, but it's not near as important as the crucifixion. Amen. Number four, once a scriptural truth is received, never let your grip slip. Buy the truth, it says in Proverbs 23, 23. Buy the truth and sell it not. Buy the truth and sell it not. Lost sinner, there is an alluring factor in life that makes us think that somehow when we die, everything's going to be okay whether we were a Christian or not. After all, everybody's not Christians, right? I mean, there's Muslims and Buddhists and all sorts of things. But yet Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, if this is truth and we believe it is, then Jesus is the only way. Yeah, three of us believe that. 
the scorpion and the frog. Somehow we, we feel like if we, just, uh, if we just become friends with the world, friends with the culture, blend in with the culture, blend in with the other religions, that everything will just finally turn out okay. The frog was sitting on the bank of the river wanting to cross to the other side, but the waters were pretty ferocious coming down. The flood waters were high and swift. The scorpion is sitting over to the side, and the scorpion says, Mr. Frog, you've heard the fable. Mr. Frog, can I ride across the swollen river on your back? Frog said, Mr. Scorpion, I'm afraid not. I know you. You're a scorpion, and scorpions sting, and I can't, I can't let you ride on my back. The scorpion said, but Mr. Frog, look, use some reason. You can swim and I can't and you could let me on your back and we could both get to the other side and if we got halfway across and I decided to sting you, that would mean my death the same as yours. So would I be so foolish as to sting you? Frog said, I better not do it. Scorpion said, look, do you think I would commit suicide? To get to the other side, I need you to let me ride on your back. And the merciful thing to do would be for you to let me ride. We'll keep each other company on the trip. The frog said, well, okay. Hop on. And so they start across the river. And sure enough, halfway, the scorpion stings the frog. And as they both begin to sink, the frog says, scorpion, you lied to me. The scorpion said, you knew, I were, you knew I was a scorpion. Scorpion sting. I could do nothing else but sting you. It's your fault, frog. And they both sank. Sin is that way. We all have a problem with sin. Every human being that's ever been born is born with a sin nature. And when one dies clinging to his sin instead of the Savior, he will sink along with his sin. The devil will go down, but you're going with him if you didn't trust Jesus. I hope, maybe I'm talking to somebody on the internet, you'd take this opportunity while your mind is thinking about it. Sin will kill you for all eternity. Jesus promises to forgive you if you'll trust him as your savior. And he'll take you to heaven for eternity. What's the better choice? Let's pray together. Father, we love you and thank you for the scriptures that make us wise unto salvation. Lord, I pray that you'd bless us as we come to this decision hour. Lord, there's some who may not be saved, and Lord, I pray that they'd realize that the love of the Lord Jesus is so tremendous that even though they are sinners, that Jesus wants to save them and forgive their sin and give them a home in heaven. And Lord, for the Christians who may feel comfortable with sin, even though they've been saved, they still tamper with it. Help them to realize that that scorpion of sin still stings. And though their soul won't be lost if they've been saved, their joy can be lost, their testimony can be lost, their effectiveness and purpose can be lost. For those who maybe have not let Christianity affect their decisions and their quest for truth has become almost non-existent, help them, Lord, to embrace the quest for truth today. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And while, while we're bowing,